I'm Kevin Shaw, and you're watching the Watercraft Journal. Easily one of the best rides I had been on was exploring Pamlico Sound in Cape Hatteras. That was way back in 2008, so the fog of memory has glossed over the unrelenting beating that we took while riding from Cedar Point to Ocracoke Island. I can certainly recall encountering brutal conditions as we passed the inlet, but the sting of salt water in my eyes and the aching in my joints has all but vanished over the years. So when the opportunity to return to North Carolina's intercoastal waterway arose, I couldn't say no. Unlike the first trip, which was planned and paid for by Kawasaki's media group, this week would be at our own leisure. This was to be a family trip. While the wife and two youngest kids were going to ride on Uncle Ted's 21-foot center console boat, my oldest would join me on the Sea-Doo. I had picked up a 2022 Sea-Doo GTX Limited 300 opted in premium sage green metallic only two weeks earlier and frankly only had been out on it twice before our leaving. Apart from the standard equipped tech package, everything else about it was an old hat. Four years of testing and loaners had provided me plenty of seat time with the platform and all of its ins and outs. The GTX in its current form was first introduced as a 2018 model. It's what BRP calls its ST3 platform and marries several unique attributes together to make a very unusual machine. Prior to launching the new design, Sea-Doo had its Fish Pro ready to release the next model year, so certain characteristics needed to be baked into the crust, namely the utmost in watercraft stability at static and low speeds for fishing. Equally, the ST3 needed to accommodate the Wake Pro models, so a large rear platform with an integrated link accessory system and ski pylon mount was designed, as well as deep open footwells, again for the Fish Pro. The traditional bow storage was relocated to a large 25.3 gallon center storage tub, accessible from a seated position. Lastly, as it would serve the RXTX, the sporty ErgoLock seat from the RXPX was adapted as well. Introduced in 2022, the aforementioned tech package equips the GTX Limited 300 with a full color 7.8 inch display chock full of smartphone integration. Synced via Bluetooth, USB, and the BRP Go smartphone app, riders can play music, monitor the weather, and use GPS navigation. At each flank is a 50-watt waterproof speaker, equaling 100 watts total, that integrates the BRP Bluetooth premium audio sound system to your device. Of course, beneath the two-tone stitched and piped seat is a 1630 ACE three-cylinder four-stroke producing 300 horsepower at just over 8,000 RPM. The same power plant that powers the sporty RX-TX300 and the race-ready RX-PX300. Finally, the GTX's $18,299 MSRP also includes the center storage bin organizer mesh net divider, padded knee coves, and all-weather PwC cover totaling out the limited package. We set up camp in Cape Carteret, just inland from Emerald Island. After visiting the historic Fort Macon pre-Civil War fort the day before, we set in at Beaufort and journeyed past the U.S. Coast Guard Sector Field Office before carrying on beyond the inlet, tracing the shoreline of Shackleford Banks. The Beaufort Inlet feeds the back sound, which we discovered was an undulating labyrinth of ever-changing shoals and sandbars that change with the ebb and flow of the tide. At no time was I more grateful for the onboard depth sounder continually chiming as the seafloor rose to meet our hull. Equipped with this in-dash feature and a far more shallow draft than the center console boat, we let the sea dew lead the path forward. Channel markers are regularly relocated by the Coast Guard to give boaters the deepest route through the sound, which at times was less than 9 feet deep. We arrived at Cape Lookout, the outwardmost tip of J-Hooked Island made famous by the pirates Edward Blackbeard Teach, Steed Royal James Bonnet, and Anne Bonny. The Cape is known mainly for its iconic black and white checkered lighthouse, earning its name. We avoided some high rising shoals and anchored over 50 yards from shore. The younger kids dug for shells as we prepared sandwiches and cooled down with some cold drinks. 
I had looped the end of my sand docker anchor to the GTX's bow eye and watched as the changing and quickly receding tide pulled the sea due opposite of where we had anchored. Concerned, I hustled from shore and began dragging the ski into deeper water. The tide was quickly going out and unless we wanted to camp overnight, we needed to get moving, so we collapsed the easy up and began loading up the boat. Shackleford, like other banks, are home to native wild horses, believed to be the descendants of abandoned Spanish horses left to graze and populate the Carolina coastline. These horses crossed over on long eroded isthmuses and remain on these grassy barrier islands. Unfazed by gawking spectators, these horses saunter up to the shoreline to nibble on lush salt grass and bulrush. From Cape Lookout we rode to the deepest part of the channel to Hawker's Island. It was here where the boat traffic picked up, and together with the afternoon's Atlantic gusts and outgoing tide, the GTX's hull began acting up. Despite Sea-Doo's claims, the ST3 is not a deep V hull, nor a superior offshore rough water design. In reality, it's quite the dramatic opposite. What deceives most of the uninitiated, as it being a deep V hull, is its pronounced prow. At midships, the ST3 is demonstrably flat, smoothing out to a single digit dead rise, giving the hull its characteristic stability at static to slow speeds. The smooth bottom attributes to the ST3's top speed numbers, but that is in purely glassy conditions. In mild chop, or even in tracking through the wakes of other watercraft, the ST3 wanders unpredictably. In larger sea state conditions and or elevated speeds, this bow hunting can become precarious to the novice rider as it requires a tremendous amount of rider input to keep it tracking true. Over time, I've come to find that the ST3 is best suited for flat water conditions at best. Even professional racers have abandoned the hull for the more manageable T3R hull of the RXPX. But as noted, it's not all bad. The ST3 is tremendously stable at slow speeds and provides an impeccably dry ride. This is due to the bow's shape that fans into deep concave coves. By directing its forward wake outward in an unfurling arc, it makes it a far more drier ride than a true deep V hull, which spits and sprays the water upward. At slow speeds, the ST3's bow creates a roiling cushion that softens its ride in no wake zones. So again to recap, the sea dew sprays its wake out while others spray up. It's that simple. Of course, the biggest appeal of the GTX and all ST3 based sea dews is the deck design. Sea dew sports a low slung, handsome shape that is angular as it is masculine. The five way adjustable tilt steering is seemingly perfectly placed for most riders of any height and takes the 7.8 inch digital dashboard with it as it pivots up and down for maximum visibility. And the GTX features both sea dews pioneering intelligent brake and reverse system as well as its intelligent debris free system which electronically reverses the thrust of the impeller surging a pulse of thrust forward to purge the intake rate of any debris clogging the intake rate like grass or seaweed. The handlebars aren't set too wide with large easy to navigate buttons that remain some of the most responsive in the industry. The winged palm rest hand grips support the wrist to reduce fatigue felt by riders after a long day on the water. Navigating the pages of sea split screen dashboard is limited while at speed, but other functions like changing dashboard background colors and tracking fuel consumption and trip hours is a snap. Unfortunately, the premier functions found with the tech package and available through the BRP Go app are excruciatingly frustrating, particularly for those less tech savvy. The process of syncing one's smartphone to the GTX requires logging a new profile into the dashboard. Then it must be synced via Bluetooth through your phone's Bluetooth settings page. Once completed, the CDU will pair with your phone. Yet that is solely for using the sound system separate of the tech package, which will not allow you to control tracks and volume through the handlebar toggles. If you choose to control your playlist through the dash and handlebar controls, the phone must be continually tethered through an approved USB cord, that is if you have an Apple iPhone, with the BRP Go app left open. The app will automatically sign out if the phone goes into driving mode or if the cord wiggles enough to break the link. Moreover, the BRP Go app requires a solid data signal or two will automatically sign out. And needless to say, in many locations outside of highly populated areas, such a usable signal of any magnitude is nowhere to be found. This lack of a signal also will keep you from accessing your music library if it's stored on the cloud, so make sure you've got a song list downloaded to your phone if you simply cannot enjoy the outdoors without an added stimulation. The glove box is another pinch point. 
The glove box cannot accommodate most modern full-size phones, particularly larger Androids. With the BRP Go app requiring the phone to be plugged into the USB port at all times, the watertight door cannot be latched, as the phone must sit on top of it. This leaves your phone subject to getting wet as the glove box door doesn't close fully with the phone outside of its waterproof pocket. All of that notwithstanding, the shining jewel of the GTX is its overall comfort. The narrowed ergolock seat, deep saddle, and low-backed bolsters are comfortable, even for a taller rider. Passengers are entreated with similar cushioning and larger handrails at the rear passenger side. Sadly, without a glove box of any usable size, drinks or sunscreen must be kept within the center storage bin, which cannot be accessed easily while underway. After idling through Taylor Creek, which separates Carrot Island from Beaufort, we pulled the boat and GTX up the ramp and enjoyed the evening after a full day on the water. The next morning, we pulled in closer to home base and sped southwest towards Hammocks Beach and Bogue Inlet. There, we played on the beach and listened to the Marine base fire off artillery rounds in the distance. With some time to spend and plenty of super unleaded in the 18.5 gallon fuel tank, I, with my 12-year-old behind me, sped off to play in the incoming Atlantic surf. We wrapped the throttle and launched gleefully over the whitecaps. Jumping surf is a dangerous game that is discouraged by BRP per the owner's manual, and for good cause. While we didn't press our luck too far, we did dislodge a GoPro camera from its mount. We found it bobbing on its bright orange float seconds later, thankfully. During this little jaunt in the surf, we did note one more picadillo about the GTX Limited. The sage green metallic paint is striking in person, particularly when the sun hits it just right. But boy, it's wholly invisible out on the open ocean. Were it not for my bright red slippery array life vest and matching UV blocking jersey, we'd be lost to anyone searching for us. The rest of the morning was spent tracing the shoreline, carefully navigating around shallows and sandbars, and pinning the supercharged Rotax when I encountered a rare patch of glass. On our journey back to the ramp, we happened upon a pair of dolphin, a mother and a calf, swimming up the intracoastal. This was my daughter's first time seeing dolphins in the wild, so we stopped the engines and let the current take us with it, hoping to get a closer look. As noon bled into afternoon, we returned back to the launch ramp and drove back to camp. The sea dew served us well and provided plenty of smiles, but as far as a serviceable review, I found myself struggling with a near 50-50 split of praises and criticisms. Given the hours our loner carried, many of its panels as well as the speakers had begun to loosen and audibly chattered even on mildly bumpy water. Equally, even though our time on the rough open seas were minimal at best, I found salt deposits inside of the center storage, glove box, and engine compartment. We found the glove box, the need for the smartphone to be plugged in for the app to function, and the interface itself egregious, enough for me to suggest totally avoiding the frustration altogether. Too often we become so attached to new conveniences that we wonder how we ever have lived before without them. But in this case, if you can purchase a SeaDoo without these contrivances, I suggest you do it. Most importantly, the ST3 hull is problematic. It wanders, oftentimes erratically in chop, teeters to one side to another when not at plane, below 35 miles per hour, and has been shown to wholly ignore steering input in tight corners, sometimes putting its pilot in precarious situations. It's really something I can't in good conscience omit from this review. All that being said, there's a great deal to praise the 2022 SeaDoo GTX Limited for and hope that we've adequately listed those attributes here as well. Although it's meant to offer the consumer the utmost in luxury and premier features, the SeaDoo GTX Limited falls just a tad short, delivering more sizzle than steak. While other models offer similar comfort with greater performance, superior rough water tracking and more storage, none do all simultaneously. And that is why the GTX Limited 300 is the top tier machine of BRP's premium lineup. I'm Kevin Shaw and you've been watching the Watercraft Journal. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. It'll definitely help us grow the channel. And if you want more awesome jet ski content, please visit us at www.watercraftjournal.com where new articles are written and published every day, Monday through Friday, entirely subscription free to you.